Super. Okay, thanks everyone. We might make a start. This is the final section in training load two. Um, we've got three, three presentations to, to come next. They're going to follow on nicely from Sergio's presentation, kind of a, coming from a coach. The next three, we're going to get a little bit more science-y, and um, it's going to be some physiology, some, um, some, some psychology, um, and some neural stuff in there. So uh, this will please the scientists in the room. Um, our first speaker coming from Australia is, is um, Dr. Jamie Stanley. Uh, I've had the pleasure of uh, working with, with Jamie before through a few uh, collaborative projects. He is a handy little triathlete himself um, at the uh, half Ironman distance. And then he also is a um, performance scientist at uh, the South Australian Institute of Sport. Um, in Adelaide. Um, so we, he's going to talk uh, today about training monitoring in, in uh, elite triathletes. So would you please join me in welcoming Dr. Jane, Jamie Stanley. Thanks Paul and thanks Jan and the uh, organizing committee for giving me this opportunity to speak amongst some big names in sports science and triathlon. Um, and because I'm sure most of you don't, don't know me, I made sure I wore the same, the same shirt as is in the, uh, the conference um, handbook. So because this is a triathlon conference, my presentation is broken into three parts. Uh, firstly, I'll provide some rationale as to why we need to monitor training loads. Uh, secondly, I'll provide a framework uh, as which uh, you guys can apply um, um, monitoring with your athletes. And finally, I'll uh, present a case study of how we've implemented a monitoring um, program with an uh, Olympic level athlete. So success, this is, this is the name of the game. This is our goal. Um, and this photo captures a lot of the reasoning um, as to why we need to, to monitor training. So as you can see, there's four guys in this photo. Um, Simon won, but they're all separated by about a second. So that's the difference between a $100,000 paycheck and I can't remember, it might have been 20 grand or something. So it's a big difference. Um, and so athletes at this level, because the difference between winning and losing is so small, they operate at a very high training load level, as Sergio has explained just before me. So what does it take to, to succeed at this level? So up here, oops, I've got the, we've got the, um, the mean times for the top 10 at the Rio test event and at the Chicago grand final. And you can see that the difference between first place and the mean time for the top 10 is about 1%. So very small difference between, between uh, those placings. Um, and down here you can see the general level that's required um, to, to perform at, at this level. So just a quote from a guy that I, uh, I guess, follow quite closely, Stephen Saylor. The more easy training you do, the harder you can do your hard training. And the harder you do your hard training, the bigger the adaptation. So in elite Olympic distance triathlon, as Sergio has has shown in much more detail than me. Um, typically, athletes can, can train between 15 to 30, 35 hours a week, and it's split um, amongst the three disciplines as well as the extra conditioning kind of, uh, kind of work. So again, just some general weekly structures. There's a million different ways you can structure a week, um, and these are just three examples from um, some top guys, I'm sure some of them look kind of familiar from the previous presentation, um, but it's just an example that their weeks are pretty full um, and the training load is, is high and, and with that the need for monitoring is even higher. So again, coming back to Simon, uh, I know Joel is going to have a presentation on, on this guy tomorrow, 
but I just want to show you a, a one-minute clip from this series of videos from 2011. Is there a sound? I'm at the lake, and because I don't want to, you know, Tim Don and, and Jan Fridino put up these massive, massive training days, I was probably just going to put my feet up. But because this is my training day on Specialized, I'm just going to go run. I'm going to add up some strange numbers and come up with a really big number. And it's, the math's not going to work, but that's irrelevant. When you walk away from watching this, you think to yourself, he swam 7.5K, he rode 100, and he ran 40, and that's just a typical day and it's bigger than Tim Don does. So I guess there's a lot of uh, athletes out there, um, more at the amateur level, that have this philosophy that more is better and more is, more is what it takes. Um, but you have to bring it down to what the actual purpose of each training session is about. So a training session is a stimulus or a stressor um, which is going to initiate signaling pathways, which hopefully will lead to a positive adaptation, which will transfer to a performance result. Now, at the elite level, as we know, training loads are very high, but as training load increases, the, it's a law of diminishing uh, returns. So there's a sweet spot where you can you train, you increase your training load and the magnitude of the positive effects increases, um, but then it reaches a plateau. But at the same time, the side effects, which can be negative, such as fatigue or risk of injury, is increasing exponentially. So elite athletes typically work up in this zone here, so you have to be very careful, and that's where the monitoring um, comes in. So... Monitoring is key for management. So managing and understanding the training stress and load, whether this is acute or chronic, um, whether it's me mechanical, uh, metabolic, or neural. Um, I guess the focus of my presentation is more on the, the metabolic side. Um, there's other factors and, and things that you can monitor to, to assess mechanical and, and neural load. Um, understanding the training stress balance or one's form or readiness to perform and understanding the load and performance relationships. So what does the effect of a taper or a recovery period have on performance after an overload block? Um, are your athletes verging on non-functional overreaching and, and will there be a supercompensation that you, you are hoping for? Or have you pushed them too far and their performance will never come back? Um, it's also about managing the progression of increasing training loads. So, some data from the AIS, um, they've been, we've got this uh, mon online database monitoring system, so athletes have been putting data in every day. Um, this, this data is mainly for physio sort of data, but basically high training load reached progressively will obviously increase performance, but maintaining a high training load is also um, useful for minimising injury risk. However, a rapid increase in training load will lead to an injury or illness risk. Um, and just anecdotally, so in the third week in January, um, these physios found that there was a spike in the number of athletes reporting injury. And they were thinking, why is this? And over in Australia, over Christmas, most programs typically have that a week of deload during Christmas and New Year so the athletes can, can spend time with their family. And they worked out that once they came back into training after that time, that the increase in load was, was so acute that people broke down like in two or three weeks. So going back through the numbers and looking at the training load, they found that if you increase your training load, your, your, your training, acute training load over your chronic training, training load ratio, if that was greater than 150%, then you're, you're pretty likely to have an injury in the following one to three weeks. And consistency, so more data from the AIS. So this really highlights why we need to, to monitor the training and make sure that it's progressive. Um, so during the six months prior to a goal competition, uh, athletes who attained less than 80% of their planned training were seven times more likely to fail at their goal competition. Of the athletes who achieved less than 80%, 
of their goal uh, training, only 2% of those were successful. And finally, any uh, modified training week um, in those six months increased your likelihood of failure to perform at your desired level at that key competition by 26%. And finally, it's about educating, educating the athletes, educating the coaches, and gaining an understanding of what the stimulus is and how long the, the, um, the athlete will take to recover from the stimulus. So you can see here, um, this is heart rate variability sort of used as a, as a surrogate to monitor training recovery. You can see these two weeks here, both of them have 10 sessions. They've got three high intensity sessions, one threshold session, and six in, uh, light intensity sessions. But the way that the sessions are structured in the timing, the, the out, outcome or the, the adaptation at the end of that week is very different. So that's something that monitoring can also help inform the coaches and athletes of. So this is a, a framework or a model which is pretty common sense, but um, is, is, I guess, the way we work in Australia, um, and I'm sure in many other places. Um, and it's a three sort of level model um, where you, you have got different levels with different levels of specificity um, which can be implemented um, depending on your resources and the level of athlete. So the foundation level, which um, everyone should have access to the resources for this, revolves around this, uh, the coach-athlete relationship. Um, this, is, this, this, is, this underpins everything in elite sport. Um, how well the coach knows the athlete um, and how, how accepted, how, how the athlete um, is willing to, to talk to the coach and, and give feedback is, is just, it's the basis. So if a, co if a coach is able to, to look the athlete in the eye, um, understand the body language at each session, they can have a pretty good understanding of how the athlete is recovering without the athlete saying anything at all. Um, and likewise, if the athlete is feeling close to breaking, um, they should feel comfortable in telling the coach that, you know, I'm not feeling 100%, do we need to modify? And then they can have a discussion as to whether that training session needs to be modified or they need extra uh, rest or recovery. So on top of this, um, to quantify the load, the training load, um, I guess there's these, these models proposed by Foster. Um, and in a lot of sports that don't have the fancy power meters or, or the ability to, to measure metabolic um, stress, um, it's basically duration of the session times by the perceived exertion or perceived intensity. And so sports like swimming, for example, use this kind of model um, every day. And, and that's how we can quantify, as sports scientists, the, the changes in load that the athletes are experiencing. There's one, there's one thing to, um, to be wary of, and that, that can be the bias between the athlete um, thinking they know what the coach is prescribing. So say, for example, a coach um, has prescribed a session, um, and they, in their head, have, a, have an idea of what, what load that will be. Say it might be 80 points out of 100. The athlete does the session, but they perceive that session to be, be 95 out of 100. So you have to be aware of those discrepancies. So an example, um, a couple of months ago, we, we were doing this stuff with a swimmer. Um, the swimmers log their, their main set. They log the, the amount of time, or the, they describe the, the main set as race pace work, high intensity work. Um, there's different categories laid out. The coach also has that. Um, this particular athlete, I'd, I'd done the report, sent it to the coach, and he goes, hang on, this athlete has said we've done, you know, seven sessions this week of race intensity work, and it was only really three. So that prompted a discussion, and that just shows that, you know, this monitoring, while there are some flaws, it provokes this conversation, and, and it brings the athlete and coach together to sort of work through potential problems which could... Um, have big implications down the track in terms of injury or overtraining. Um, some sports go a little bit further. They've, um, 
they can have more specific kind of questionnaires, um, but basically it, it are simple scales. So out of 10, how is your sleep quality? What's your stress level like? Your fatigue, your soreness? So most top coaches, they, they will use this. They, they might not necessarily record it every day, but in their head looking and speaking to the athlete, these are the things that they look for. Um, if you do have a system like we do in Australia where the athlete has an app and they record this every day, um, you can set parameters as a sports scientist or coach. So say an athlete has a maximal or high level of fatigue for three days in a row, you can get an email or a text message that morning to warn you before the athlete gets there that they've reported this and that you should probably have a conversation as to you know, how are you feeling, are you able to do this session as planned. So that's the alerts. Um, and also there's other sort of more sports side questionnaires which have been shown to be quite effective at um, tracking acute and chronic changes in training load. Um, but I guess to implement them you need, you need to have the support of a specialist psychologist. So moving up to the, the next level, which is a more objective quantification of loads. So I just have to say that all of these levels um, compound on top of each other. So you, you wouldn't just go to this, the second level without maintaining the first level. So traditionally, um, you do performance tracking via lab or field tests. Um, so in, in elite sporting institutes, you've obviously got access to metabolic carts, um, ergometers, treadmills. Um, if you didn't have access to that, then field testing, doing standardized uh, tests at the track or an ergo, ergo set um, would allow you to do this. But today, with the advent of all these um, gadgets, which triathletes love because there's numbers, um, you can quantify um, more objectively the training loads. So in this, this model, you've got the coach and athlete relationship, which remains, but then you also have the specific software or a sports scientist, if you've got that resource, um, to better quantify the load more objectively um, and then look at the internal and external loads. So heart rate, an internal load, power, an external load. And so to quantify the recovery status, you need to do this by contextualizing uh, internal external load data from sessions. So say, for example, you're doing a maximal session um, on the bike and your heart rate is 10 beats below your max, then, then that information can be used to say, okay, this athlete is probably getting a bit fatigued in this part of the, the training um, cycle. Um, there's also the same as I've just explained, the capability to have these daily metric scores. So it's very simple to just say, okay, I slept for 10 hours today, the sleep quality was good, um, my muscle soreness was low, um, etc. And so the software that's available makes it very easy to manage this large amount of information. Um, and there's, there's more and more software out there that's basically data analytic software. So <clears throat> I'm sure most of you are familiar with this particular platform, um, but it just makes it very easy to capture the data and then break it down even further. So you can, if you've got the, the data from your power meter or your, um, your pace from your GPS or internal, data, you know, internal load data like heart rate, you can go down into each session and have a look at the intensity distribution. So if you've done course analysis for, say, the Rio course and you know what the demands are for the particular course, you know, okay, they're going to spend you know, 40 minutes in, in T4 or T5, then you can target your training sessions and you can go back and look to see that the athlete is hitting the desired stimulus that you want. You can also look more holistically at training blocks or, or a whole year, and there's, there's quite a few papers out there now that is that is uh, presenting what elite athletes actually do. And so you can work with your athletes and, and look back to see whether you're actually following this or whether is it working for your athletes or whether you're doing something completely different. You can easily um, visualize a whole or multiple years of um, 
uh, of fitness and fatigue and acute load data in, in one place. It's just, it's, it's too easy now. Um, and you can also use this um, as a feed forward, so you can, you can predict um, how an athlete will, will go if, if you prescribe a certain training load for the coming weeks. So, for example, this could be useful if you've got athletes coming, coming to a camp from, a from multiple locations and you want them to be at a certain level for this camp, um, which, is a, which is a problem, I guess, in some sports, such as um, track cycling, where you've got riders coming to a camp, they have different coaches, different backgrounds, and some could arrive at, um, at a peak level and some could arrive underdone. But if you're working as a team, then it makes it very hard to do a quality session if some athletes aren't at that correct level. So you can use this kind of modelling to ensure that athletes are, or coaches are told, OK, they need to be at this level of uh, chronic training load with these other parameters, and we know roughly that they'll end up at the camp in a similar, a similar level. Um, there's, other, there's other software out there where you can look at um, critical power modelling um, and other, other metrics which may be useful in tracking performance. So finally, after you've um, gone through those two levels and you have the resources, then comes the more spe specialist um, and more targeted uh, forms of monitoring. So Typically, this level is, is probably only accessible to the elite athletes or um, athletes who have resources of a national program or a state institute um, to support them. So this is where targeted monitoring comes into place. So you've got an elite athlete who is struggling to, to sleep or perform. Um, we know that sleep is the single most you know, effective recovery strategy. So if they're not sleeping well, then no matter how much training you do, they're, they're not going to adapt. Um, so you can bring in a, a sleep specialist, um, you can look at their sleep habits, their hygiene, um, and then you can quantify whether, okay, an intervention needs to be made. Um, and there's apps out there, given the use of, of smartphones and everyone's addicted to looking at their phone before sleeping, there's apps out there that can minimise the blue light, which might be the next step that you can practically implement with your athletes um, if you can't, if you don't have access to this next level. Um, in terms of heat or hypoxic stimulus, um, you want to measure the, the key variables that have been shown to be uh, related to performance. Um, and it's nice to know that you know, if you put an athlete in a tent for three weeks, that they are actually responding the way that the physiology would suggest they would. And if they're not, then you know that, you know, okay, changes need to be made. So in terms of um, hypoxic training, um, if you've got access, then hemoglobin mass testing. Um, you can get a pulse oximeter quite cheaply, so you can you monitor that every morning, and obviously heart rate. Um, if you're doing heat training, um, you can look at plasma volume, um, thermal sensation, and sweat loss. So the, 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 the second two there, they're probably pretty easy for anyone to, to do. And it's amazing in like a five-day heat block how quickly athletes will adapt. And you see a thermal sensation rating of five out of five on the first day to two out of five on the third day. So you can be... You just, it's a good way to feed back to know that the stimulus that you are initiating is providing the adaptation that you're, you're after. And so I've been lucky enough to have done a lot of work with this guy, Martin Duchette. He's influenced me quite a bit. Um, and so heart rate parameters are something that I'm very interested in um, as, a, as one of these specific tools to tease out um, particular, particular training monitoring issues that you may have um, with athletes. So heart rate based um, monitoring is, is I guess it's, it's not about the specifics, it's, it's about looking for trends. Um, and there's been, there's been multiple papers, um, Dan Plews and Paul have done, I guess they, they started in this chronic sort of applied field of looking at trends in um, in, in elite athletes 
um, of, of heart rate variability and how they related to you know, markers of, over, over, of overeating. Um, and they've done this with, with very high level athletes. So this paper here has got data from like the rowing squad for the New Zealand Olympic team. Um, Yarn's group, they've, they've also looked at this and uh, more and more you see that there's, there's key trends which are emerging which while there's, there's no specific sort of answer as to does this trend mean this or does this trend mean that in the athlete but there are some key trends which we can, we can look at and understand and say okay if, if um, this marker is increasing then it's likely that this athlete is, is verging on uh, overreaching. And this, this interested me so much that I did a study on an athlete I know very well for a whole year. Um, there's other markers, such as uh, heart rate recovery. And a colleague of mine at South Australian Sports Institute is looking at this, this new marker of the rate of heart rate increase. So this is very easy to, to apply in the field. Um, you just do a steady state workload and you look at the rate at which heart rate increases um, and it's been, they've demonstrated that the slowing of the rate is related to functional overreaching. After a taper, when they've freshened up and they've actually increased in performance, the rate of heart rate increase accelerates. So I guess these measures can be useful, and I guess I would, I would not say they're the be-all and end-all, but they're an additive if you've got a particular athlete who you want to monitor a particular kind of adaptation. Um, but the, the information must be interpreted um, within the context of the training phase, um, how the athlete perceives their training, and how the athlete is actually performing. So finally, I just want to present a case study of an athlete I, I used to work with in Queensland. It's an Olympic level athlete. Um, and just show you how this monitoring framework is implemented in practice. So I'd done my PhD in Queensland and this squad, I was lucky to be engaged by Stephen Moss and Sean Dioria. They were, they were keen to understand individual athlete adaptation a little bit better. So the reason for this was they'd had a history of, of um, I guess, injuries and they, wanted, they didn't feel that their tapering was optimal. So these were the two goals of this, this additional specific monitoring. So at the beginning, um, we sat down and we, each athlete has an individual performance plan. So I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with this, but you do a needs analysis, you do a competition plan, and you periodize your year so that you know when you're monitoring things, when the competitions are happening, and you know the context. So this plan um, revolved around the coach-athlete relationship, um, which was fundamental. Um, we did anthropometry measures, so uh, twice, uh, once every two weeks for the eight-month season. Uh, key training sessions were analysed for power, heart rate, uh, blood lactate. So we've got that performance quantification um, quite regularly. On top of this, we did periodic uh, lab testing, uh, training load monitoring, as I've just described, and the key part that I was hoping to bring was this daily heart rate variability uh, measurement to try and tease out how the athletes were actually adapting. So this is the first half of the season. Um, I actually got a new job at this point, so I, I wasn't able to do this every single day. Um, but you can see this is just providing the context of this particular athlete. So these two arrows here, they, that was a, a competition and the blue the blue patch here, that was an altitude block of live high, train low. You can see these grey bars are the acute training load. Uh, the blue line is the chronic training load or the fitness. And the green line is the uh, training stress balance. So this, this bike here, that was a pre-Christmas uh, bike oriented camp. So we measured heart rate variability every day almost every day for five minutes uh, in a seated position and we looked at uh, LNRM SSD and you can see here the, the dots are the seven day 
uh, weekly average, and the line is the rolling average. Um, the, gray the gray line is the actual daily values, and down below, this is the uh, daily training, um, training load. Um, yep. So again, this is the ratio of RMS, LN RMSSD and heart rate, or the RR interval. Um, so Martin has proposed that you need both, both measures to tease out more specifically how the, what adaptations are going on. Um, and so that's why we've, we've measured this here. So hopefully you can see, see this on the screens. But basically, race one, heart rate variability was trending upwards. The ratio was also trending upwards. Acute training load was um, substantially reduced. It was a, obviously a taper for the first, for the first race. Um, interpreting this data look, uh, from uh, Bouchette's framework, um, this athlete was ready to perform. Uh, the, coach, the coach's perception of how the athlete was at the time was, okay, the athlete wasn't, wasn't in great form, but they were okay. Um, however, in the race, they had a mechanical, so it's hard to gauge the performance there. Uh, race two, heart rate variability had a substantial decrease. The ratio had an increase. Again, there was a taper off in the training load. Um, the mechanism for this context of these parameters would suggest an increase in sympathetic activity and interpret it as this athlete is ready to go. Um, the coach, his interpretation was the athlete was almost ready, but not quite. Um, and then the athlete had a poor result. So this is the entire season, and you can, you can see there's no need to look at the, the nitty gritty, it's just the example. But the take home message is, um, it wasn't all a positive um, outcome. So the positives from this season were there was no injuries, there was two podiums at World um, Championship Series, um, and I guess the big thing for me was that it prompted a more critical approach and dialogue between the sports scientists and the coach to maybe think more specifically about you know, the load that they were applying and specific sessions. Uh, so the negatives, the data that the objective data on the specific data that we we collected did not necessarily correlate with the coach's perception all of the time um, and the specific data we collected is also quite labor intensive and requires specialist analysis so obviously you can't sustain this all the time um, so i guess yeah it comes down to being targeted in what you want to monitor so in summary Training, training monitoring is, I guess, it's, it's similar to uh, exercise pres prescription. You need to be targeted and you need to be specific to the requirements of the athlete. So there's no point measuring stuff that is not going to be applicable to the athlete level. Um, it needs to be as simple as possible, but obviously within this, this, this framework, it can be quite complex. Um, but the underlying measures need to be valid. It needs to be an integrated approach. Um, and, of course, there needs to be prompt feedback to the coach and the rest of the uh, support staff. So, thank you. Great. Thank, thank you very much, Jamie. Uh, we have time for a couple questions. Who would like to start us off? Okay, I'll, I'll start with, uh, with one question. Jamie, um, what do you think would be the, um, the, the bare basics that, you, um, that, that coaches can, um, can, can use in terms of uh, monitoring devices um, to, to monitor their athletes? I guess the, the most basic and most simple thing that a coach can implement is those, those like daily stress scores. So, you know, rating on a Likert scale, one to 10, how is your sleep quality? Um, what's your stress level like? What's your fatigue level like? What's your muscle soreness? Like, anyone could do that. Um, and that is what most of the good coaches actually use to, to base their, their programs off. Do you ask, is there a question there? Yeah. I 
Hello. Um, I, I think in, uh, in Australia you always use um, a typical week with a uh, Friday off, or maybe it's a legend, but uh, I think I saw it on, on a program. And I always ask myself for the recovery, if it's better to, to give an athlete a, a full day off, or maybe a 24, uh, 24 hours of a recovery, like uh, you train in the morning, nothing in the afternoon, and the next day uh, you don't train in the morning and you start again in the afternoon make a break, but uh, always keep uh, an activity every day. So did you uh, realize the difference uh, when you monitor the training? Uh, I guess it comes down to the athlete and the coach. So there's, there's a million ways you can program a week. If an athlete feels that um, having a complete day off um, is a mental break, more than, you know, you can have 24 hour gap between sessions, but still do a session on consecutive days. So some athletes might perceive that as not having a break. So I guess it comes down to the individual. Thank you. J Jamie, um, I just wanted to ask um, what are your opinion is in regards to obviously there's a lot to do with uh, wearable um, data that's uh, coming in now, wearable electronics that are entering into a lot of phases of sport. Do you feel that in your conversation you mentioned about the interpretation of the athlete and the coach and how that being such an important part is it going to be uh, something that these, the coaches here have to learn to, to understand about how they interpret that data with the likes of yourself to the athletes? I guess, as Sergio said, we're, we, we're reaching the limit of the number of hours an athlete can train a week. And so we need to be smarter about organising um, the daily sessions and the intensity of the sessions. And to do that, you need to have a pretty tight understanding of, of what the, the underlying mechanism of, of a stimulus is. Um, and the time course of recovery um, so that you can optimise that week. So, yeah, in the long, in the long term, yeah. Uh, as I have seen, uh, you are referring um, a lot of your studies to Steven Seiler, uh, who also did some studies about um, heart variability. And uh, he was tracking heart variability in cross-country skiers. And he sometimes uh, did a tweet like hair in the yogurt theory, which means he could not rely on the data of heart um, variability measure. What is your point here? Is it just a collection of various data or is it applied? It's a, it's a bit of both. So one, collecting the data means that you've got a reference to look back on and I guess the idea is that you collect enough data that you can look for trends. And so if you find repeated trends, say one parameter is decreasing and another is increasing the week before a race, and that happens consistently, then you can, you can be more certain that the way you've organised your training is inducing a, a, uh, the response that you want. But again, you do have to be careful that you don't get bogged down with the, the amount of data that you collect because in the end you have to... It, yeah, you have to um, yeah see the wood for the trees. Yeah, yeah. I, I often think of it as an extra tool in the toolbox kind of thing. One extra thing you can kind of use, you know, pattern recognition rec recognition for. So I think we'll leave it Jimmy? there. Um, Just one th question. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, do you think, from your experience on the continuum of fatigue, there may be some uh, chronology of the symptoms which develops? like objective versus um, perceptive or specific? Um, I guess there, there is a lot of data saying that, you know, if, if you're reaching that sort of level of functional overreaching, then your performance is actually going to decrease. And then there's also markers that reflect that. So if you're trying to do a maximal, a maximal effort and you're on the verge of functional overreaching, then your max heart rate that you achieve will be, be not quite at, at your your actual level when you're fresh. So, um, yeah. Maybe you, the, first, the first symptom will be heart rate? Uh, yeah, so, so I guess, the, oh, so I guess the, the symptoms that you can look for, you have to sort of take in the, whole, the holistic sort of um, the data that you have. So you look at, look at the training context and the performance and the heart rate data, but you also need to take into account the athlete's percep perception of how they're feeling. Great. Thank you, Jamie. We're going to keep the time, so could you please thank Jamie Stanley for a great presentation.